Well, what do we have on tap tonight? Well, 21st Century Radio. Let's see. Our subjects are going to be... Sit up straight out there now. Eyes straight ahead, feet flat on the floor, and there's to be no talking. You can chew gum. We allow that every now and then. Yeah. We're like our president. We control everything. Now, the subjects covered tonight are Deep Principles of Kabbalistic Alchemy, Lightning Flash of Olive. It's published by the Lightning Flash of Olive in 2017 by David Kime Smith. And The Awakening Ground, A Guide to Contemplative Mysticism by David Kime Smith, Bear and Company, 2016. And Kaminsky's podcast, A Cult of Personality. Of course, it should have been Greg Kaminsky's. <laughs> so that a cult of personality, which I'd love to hear sometime, and research into medieval alchemy. Go to www.occultofpersonality.net and also with David, go www.davidcom, C-H-A-I-M, Smith. Have we got that spelled correctly there, uh, Courtner? All right. Our guest tonight is Greg Kaminsky, a scholar of Western esotericism who recently completed a graduate degree at Harvard in medieval studies. In addition to pursuing these interests academically, Greg is also the creator, producer, and co-host of a long-running podcast, A Cult of Personality, that explores the esoteric with authors and experts in the field. His desire to create the podcast in 2006 began with a lifelong compulsion to learn more about ancient civilizations, world religions, symbolism, and the underlying hidden wisdom which they contain by only convey, but only conveyed to the initiated. Greg Kaminsky is also going to be talking to us tonight about the work of David Kahn Smith since they became acquainted in 2009. Greg has avidly followed the work of artist and author David Kime Smith. David published a book with inner traditions that caught my eye recently called The Awakening Ground, A Guide to Contemplative Mysticism. And I thought the artwork David had produced inside was a revelation and a wonder to behold. I had so much fun looking at these diagrams. But when we invited him to join us on 21st Century Radio, he politely declined, saying he no longer does interviews or appearances. He suggested we speak to Greg Kaminsky, an historian and scholar and editor of Smith's groundbreaking text on contemplative mysticism entitled Deep Principles of Kabbalistic Alchemy. So that's what we're doing tonight for the next two hours. Join us as we touch on the wide spectrum of ideas involving Hermeticism, the Kabbalah, mysticism, and alchemy. Thank you for joining us on 21st Century Radio. Greg Kaminsky. Thank you, Dr. Bob. It's a pleasure to join you so so much. Uh, I've listened to you for so many years, so it's great to finally speak with you. How did we bump it into each other on the air? I mean, how did you discover our show? Uh, well, I grew up in the uh, Maryland area, and uh, I was familiar with you and your work, and uh, I've followed you on the Internet uh, subsequently, so uh, I'm... S- Every now and then I check in, catch a show. I'm always interested in what you're doing and the topics you explore. So I think there's some overlap in our areas of interest. Yeah. Well, tell about telling us about your background, Greg. Sure. Um, Well, you mentioned as I I recently completed my um, master's degree in medieval studies. And um, congratulations on that. Thank you. We were going to give you a Ph.D. from what's the matter you Oh, uh, <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> Would you like point. one? Would you like sure. your PhD in Why West Russell? Okay, we'll make sure we do send you one in a couple. Of, well, we'll send them with the other propaganda we're sending you. Great. Cause, so, because uh, we're sending you a lot of propaganda. That's always good. It is. Uh, I enjoy uh, medieval studies, obviously, and um, the Renaissance time period, philosophy, and history, and. Uh, religion and those subjects from European history primarily. So, um, but 
prior to going back to school for my degree, I had uh, begun exploring these areas, particularly in the field of Western esotericism, which would cover things like ceremonial magic, Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, tarot, and a variety of other things. And uh, I've just been fascinated by these subjects. Um, and I created a podcast, a cult of personality in order to interview people about these subjects, because at the time that I started the show, which was probably 2006, uh, there was very little information online in terms of uh, interviews with authors or people exploring these ideas in uh, in an audio format, which I was really um, hungry for at that point. And I loved listening to podcasts, so I figured it was a natural fit and somebody had to do it. So I happily um, took on that job and have been able to speak with, uh, uh, at this point, what seem like uh, countless authors and experts, researchers in various subjects of the esoteric. And uh, the education has been profound in, in many ways. Well, this, this particular area, obviously, uh, I have great appreciation for. And, um, you know, I'm going to... I would like to read something from, uh, I guess, Deep Principles of Kabbalistic Alchemy and ask you a question before we, we move on. Because uh, this really touches me deeply. Uh, on page 93 in Deep Principles of Kabbalistic Alchemy, reads, To the mainstream point of view, asking people to leave their limited concerns is tantamount to asking a rational person to become insane. Therefore, this path is not for the masses and should not even be suggested where it is inappropriate. Sullying the nobility of the path within the cheapness of culture is profoundly unuseful. Great language there. Therefore, authentic practitioners should keep their longing private and seek realization in secret. Occultists who announce their special qualities with fashion statements of identity have little chance in passing beyond fixations. Therefore, we hide in plain sight, not superficially exhibiting our path, but not running away either. We do what needs to be done in accord with tradition and innovation, but nothing more. This is how it has always been, and how it will continue to be in order to do this work while caught in the mixing field of the in-between. Could you please elaborate a little bit about this, one on this, please? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a very profound statement and I think is a good summation of a point of view on this subject that's... Um, it's not very popular these days. Um, I think much of what you would find in the esoteric community, if you will, is, and I may use finger quotes as I say that, um, is uh, you find a lot of people who, for lack of a uh, alternative perspective, at times, um, embraces uh, outward manifestations of their interests. So this could be anything from jewelry to fashion to um, the way that one portrays themselves on Facebook as a frauder or soar of some esoteric society or order. Um, throwing around symbols, um, whether they be tattoos or patches or T-shirts or simply on social media, as a way to create a persona. Um, what David is talking about here is true esoteric practice that is transformative 
and requires uh, ultimately giving up of persona and personality, not that the individual um, idiosyncrasies would necessarily disappear because we're all individuals and we have our ways, but the embracing of ideas and a look or a fashion as a way to define who and what one is, is a uh, profoundly antithetical to this mystical path that David has um, undertaken. And to that point, as you mentioned, he is essentially lives as a hermit practitioner. He does not do interviews. Uh, he doesn't do talks or book signings or appearances or art shows or any of that because that's not what he's about. He's about doing his practice and the books and the artwork and me talking with you now are all results of his practice and nothing more. And it's not a, an attempt to create a, a mysterious uh, persona or uh, a unique uh, way of being to in any way uh, be, make his work more popular. Um, if anything, I think his his lack of engagement with the public would would result in the opposite. Um, but like he says there, uh, this is not for everybody. Uh, most people uh, have no interest in giving up the the sort of outer trappings of beingness. Um, but only I think what what he's implying there, or maybe it's not so implied. It's pretty explicit. Is only by giving up these outer trappings and these this conceptuality can one really penetrate into the deeper mysteries that he is really inviting people to partake of well thank you that that is so important wow i am so glad that, that i've seen this work and i've met you again maybe we've met before in other lifetimes excel but but we see very little of this going on today. The ego, especially with so many shamans running around today, uh, telling us they know just about everything, um, I find a little bit repulsive. And it certainly does not do a world of good to uh, the deeper aspects of, of our um, raising our consciousness and becoming uh, more involved with one's reason for being here, which I think that silence, which I'm, I'm, if you don't mind, later on, I'm going to ask you to, uh, I'm going to read something on silence on page 35 that really is just so important uh, for our listeners to hear, because generally they don't hear this kind of thing on, on any radio show. Can Certainly. You, can you briefly talk about how your perspective has changed since you began the podcast more than 12 years ago? Sure. Um, oh, my boss is now bossing me around, and she's right. we got to hold that <laughs> till the break. We're going to take a break and come back, and you can cheat now. You can look at your notes and, and give us an answer to that, okay? Will do. Okay, we'll be right back <laughs> with our guest, Gregory Kaminsky, a scholar of Western esotericism. They are very rare. We are talking about the work of David Kime Smith as well as Greg's podcast, Occult Philosophy. Check out Greg's show online where they talk about like we've done things that we like to talk about, ancient civilizations, world religions, symbolism, and more at www.occultofpersonality.net. I was surprised to learn when studying the Statue of Liberty that liberty for real women is the key to humanity's survival on this planet. Truly. And also that Lady Liberty has Native American roots 
and that America has reverence for the female half of divinity or the goddess at its very foundation. Powerful women and role models for balance are all part of our new book, The Secret Life of Lady Liberty, Goddess in the New World. It's a new way to understand America's history and future. Buy your copy today at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble or from our website, SecretLifeOfLadyLiberty.com. That's SecretLifeOfLadyLiberty.com, just chock full of all new reasons to love the United States of America. Hello, everybody. This is Graham Nash. Right now, you're listening to 21st Century Radio with my friend, Dr. Bob Hieronymus. We need people that are putting the truth in front of our faces. We need leaders. We need great voices on the radio. Dr. Bob is one of them. Oh, boy. Thank you very much, Graham. You're listening to Mystic's Dream, Lorena McKennett. Mm, very nice stuff. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio with Greg Kaminsky. And uh, we're talking, of course, we're talking, of course, of, well, let's get right to it. I've already gave him the question, and he's been cheating by reading the answer. Well, I hope he has. Have you been cheating, Greg? I have been, yeah. yeah good going. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay in our country today to cheat as much as possible. Now, what is your... <laughs> No, I'll go back to this other one. Can you briefly talk about how your perspective has changed since you began the podcast more than 12 years ago? Sure. Well, when I started the podcast, uh, I had the idea that, um, which I don't think is uncommon in this country, that um, I could do it myself. And there were a lot of uh, books out there and teachers and, you know, I could learn and read and study and practice and just figure things out on my own. And, uh, that's just not really the case in this particular area of expertise. Um, in, in many areas, it is possible to learn and study and become accomplished, but, um, in the areas of the esoteric and the mystical, um, there's really no way to truly understand if you're on the wrong track or if what you're doing is really productive or you just think it is. Um, so I, that's the primary thing that I would like to get across is that um, I used to think that uh, I didn't need a teacher. Now I understand that it's really indispensable. You cannot really enter these waters without um, some sort of guidance. And um, I thought that uh, the idea of self-initiation was a reality in some level, which I really don't think is true anymore. And um, finally, um, I had some undefined ideas about tradition and what an authentic tradition consisted of and how I could define that. And I have a much better handle on those things now because um, in, the, in the esoteric realm, many traditions or groups that that identify themselves as having connection with the tradition um, often these things are somewhat murky and the connections are less than uh, clear and they're not lucid and um, they're more mythological which in some instances might be fine but for me, it's not. And so I, I needed to really get clear on a lot of these things. Having a teacher, what does it mean to be part of an authentic tradition? How, how does that work? And what should one expect as a result of that? Which is, you know, a lot of hard work and learning. And um, But mostly more orienting oneself towards the idea of uh, self-realization or gnosis or or some kind of uh, 
spiritual unfoldment, I guess would be a good way to put it. You know, when I grow up, next time I'm going to have a voice like you. <laughs> you Thanks. have a terrific voice. Yeah, good going. What good karma you must have had to get that one. Oh, thank you, Doctor Bob. Yeah. Coming from you, that's high praise. So appreciate well, that. <laughs> well, anyway, someday I'll, I'll grow up. But what is your relationship with David Kyam Smith, and how did you come to present on his behalf? What a privilege! Seriously, yeah, um, I'm truly blessed in that respect. And well, you uh, earned I met it, David. Didn't I? Fortunately, he contacted me and. I think 2008 or 2009, uh, after having heard my podcast, and we began talking about things that were common interests, and uh, he shared with me some of his artwork, and from there we just kept talking, and uh, when he would write a book, I would get a copy and read it and talk with him about it, and he was always available on the phone or instant message or whatever. So I definitely took advantage of that and cultivated a relationship with him. And I've been really just to the way he expressed his views, not just artistically, but linguistically was very pure and clear. And the, the word choice is, is so articulate and eloquent that he's able to convey what are very amorphous and difficult ideas to to grasp intellectually, I think. And but all of this boils down to the big questions in life. Who are we? Why are we here? What does it all mean? And those were the things that he was interested in. And those are the things that I'm interested in. In fact, other than those questions, I'm not really sure what else is relevant um, because the answers to those determine everything really. And so talking with David and reading his books and looking at his artwork really sparked a deep sort of longing within me f to know, I, and ultimately to better know the divine really is I guess how you could put it. So, um, you know, as we talked more, eventually David asked if I would uh, edit his 2017 book, Deep Principles of Kabbalistic Alchemy, and I jumped at the opportunity. And um, me editing the book was primarily consisted of me reading the text over and over, asking him questions about it, suggesting some alternate word choices here and there, and... Um, you know, reviewing the text, but in terms of the writing and the authoring and putting it all together, I mean, that's really his forte. And I wouldn't pretend that I had a great deal of influence over the material. If anything, I learned a, a great deal from it. So, and as a result of editing that work and talking with David on an ongoing basis, and uh, engaging in the practices that he talks about in his work, um, he's then asked me to present on his behalf since, again, he's a hermit practitioner who basically he lives in solitude most of the time doing practice and drawing and writing. So I'm, I'm blessed to be able to be here with you talking about his work because his work has, you know, brought me to that doorstep. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce anyone else to it who's interested. Well, we're very fortunate to have you on tonight. You know, what can you what can you tell us about David's background, his upbringing, and and etc. So David grew up in 1970s New York City. Um, his parents were relatively well off. But um, David, he, you know, for all intents and purposes, he grew up on the streets in New York City in the 1970s. So it's not the ideal place for a child to come of age. Um, but, the, you know, those, he was interested in music, in popular culture, 
in drugs. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the same things that many people growing up are interested in. He just maybe a little bit more so than others. Um, over time, his interest in art developed and he went to school for visual art and studied that um, in the early 1980s. Um, at some point, his interest in art really waned, I think, due to the fact that uh, modern art in, in many respects is more of a commentary on uh, the time we live in or how people, certain states of consciousness, as opposed to more classical art, um, which tried to often portray ideals of truth or beauty or goodness or, or these type of classical ideals. And so he lost interest in, in making art and became interested in Western esotericism and ceremonial magic and tarot and uh, Kabbalah and uh, eventually found his way to serious mystical practice. And uh, from there blossomed a renewed interest in creating visual art and then writing about his practice that resulted in this new art that he was creating. So in many ways, his uh, career is uh, in and of itself a real illustration of the way that authentic mystical practice can renew, revivify, even resurrect someone. And if he's not an example of that himself, I don't know anyone that is. From where is uh, David's work derived? Well, this is an important uh, question because uh, looking at his books and his artwork, <clears throat> it may not be immediately apparent, but David has a teacher, a living teacher, who is part of a living, authentic lineage that goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years into antiquity. And uh, this is a, a lineage of realized masters uh, that teach. And so David has connected with this teacher. And um, as a result of this connection to the teacher and the lineage, uh, David has learned and practiced and brought forth uh, this work. Um, deep Principles of Kabbalistic Alchemy, The Awakening Ground, uh, Bath of Bright Silence, which will be out in a few weeks, and more books to come. He's one of the most prolific artists and writers I've ever encountered. And it's all a result of this connection with his teacher and this lineage. Uh, it's like uh, a fountain, you know, that keeps bringing forth creative jewels. So it's important to understand that because that's really the, the origin point of everything that David does. Well, how fortunate for you and how fortunate for us and how fortunate for our planet. Because sooner or later, as we all evolve, I think we will, mo as we, if we want to master our, ourselves, that is their spiritual life, um, it is where we find meaning and purpose in our own personal destiny. But that's my propaganda anyway. Um, mm. What is the... Oh, no, no, no. We better... No, I can see my ball saying no, not yet, because we got to take another break to make sure that we pay for this program. Uh, when we come back, though, we're going to... I want to ask you, what is the Nasemic... Is that how do you pronounce that one? Nasemic view... And why is it important? We'll be back with our guest, Greg Kaminsky. And he uh, check out Greg's show online, where they talk about ancient civilizations, world religion, symbolism, and more, www.occultpersonality.net. And all of the sites that we have for him and his teacher are linked on the front page of 21stCenturyRadio.com.
Hi, this is Raymond Eric of the Doors, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Oh, good old Brother Ray. <laughs> oh, who's singing? Let's see, find out who's singing here. This is Sequentia. Is that correct? Is that Sequentia? No, it's not. Oh, okay, I'm wrong. Well, well, but just below that, we'll figure that out what it is a little later on. Our guest, of course, is Gregory or Greg Kaminsky, but he can also be called Gregory too. Uh, he's liberal enough to be called that. And we're going to ask him an important question right now that we gave him a good ten minutes to study up on. You ready, Greg? I'm ready. All right. Are you, are you sitting up straight? I am sitting up straight. Bro. Okay. What is the Nosemic view, and why is it important? Well, this is a this word no no semic or no semic. Uh, this is a word I think that was coined by Herbert Gunther, who's a he was a scholar of Eastern religion, and uh, the word is uh, instead of a gnostic view because gnostic has so many connotations that we definitely want to avoid. Um, he used the term no Um and this is a a term that David uses in his work to describe a point of view that um, essentially realizes that all appearance, and by all appearance that means all phenomenon, uh, all thoughts, um, all ideas, um, all classifications. Uh, all of these things are really just the expression of the divine. Um, Ein Sof, as it's termed in Kabbalah, which means no end or without end. So this is uh, this view is the basis or the foundation for David's work and practice. And as a result, it is the view that's realized as the sort of the goal, if you will, if there were a goal of this practice. So it's really the, the origin point to, to intellectually at least understand that um, there is nothing else but the divine, that all appearance and all experience is nothing but the divine expressing itself to itself through itself mm -hmm. and so once that view is established all appearance and experience takes on an entirely different meaning than the one we might have ascribed to it prior so that's really why this is so crucial is because in order to engage in this work that David's discussing in his books, this contemplative mysticism, it begins with this view. And this view is cultivated, and then this view is then realized in experience as a result of the practice. So it's crucial to have that as the beginning, the foundation that underpins it, because what I've discovered and others too in, in investigation of this, of mysticism generally, is that whatever your view is, is going to be the limit where your practice hits the wall. So if you have a view of many gods, then the sort of transcendent or ascent or the deepening experiential process starts hitting barriers at each aspect represented by a deity. Or if you're, say, a monist, uh, you know, you have one ultimate being from which all creation springs. So again, you hit the wall because you can't unite or be that creator being but with this view where it's all the divine and the divine is undefined and is undefinable 
Um, there is no barrier upon which you can collide. Uh, so it's like the mind, uh, as it goes deeper into contemplation, um, there's nothing for it to collide against that will stop it, which is the whole point, because uh, if the realization is the divine, it, there can't be any end or any barrier or any um, stop, you know, yeah. that would essentially violate how we understand it in from this view. So it's, it's really taking a perspective and, and cultivating that perspective and in order to realize that perspective. Well, what sort, from what sources does David derive his Kabbalistic teachings? Well, there's several, um, David talks a lot about the primary Kabbalistic text that he studies, which is known as the Fountain of Wisdom. This is an obscure 12th century Kabbalistic text. Um, but there are several others that he he goes to as sources, including uh, the Zohar, the Adrot section of the Zohar, and the writings of Rebbe Nachman of Breslov, who is a Hasidic teacher, and uh, his famous work, Lakuti Maharan, volumes 4, 5, and 6, are very important to David's work. So the majority of his Kabbalistic teachings come from those specific sources. But I would like to clarify that even though David's sources are all Jewish Kabbalah, he's he's integrating these sources within his own work and producing something wholly original um, through collaboration with his own teacher. But this, uh, these materials are, are very similar in the, the way that um, the Renaissance Christian Kabbalists would have used the Kabbalistic texts, like the way that... Uh, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, the originator of the Christian Kabbalah, would have taken the writings of Joseph Gikatia and other teachers and extracted pieces and saw essential truths uh, within them that could be uh, utilized in new ways. And, and I think that's precisely the way David approaches this, is uh, ultimately heretical if you're a uh, strict uh, Jew who takes the Kabbalistic tradition to be uh, something that can't be altered, uh, David is doing things with his work that in many ways could be seen as heretical. They're certainly not orthodox. They're heterodox. He's going away from orthodox practice and orthodox interpretation in order to create something wholly new with these primary source materials that totally supports what they say. So it, it completely fits in. And, and this is an, another aspect I think that can be understood about the Kabbalah is oftentimes innovation is introduced into it uh, under the guise of tradition. So David's not trying to make it seem like he's introducing uh, something that's been done in ancient times in the same way. He's, he's, in, he's bringing this nosemic view, as we talked about, to it, which differentiates it from other Kabbalah, because instead of an emanationist system where you have Ein Sof, the divine, without end, seemingly limiting itself uh, in a series of step-down emanationist uh, processes, is known as the Sefirot. So you get ten Sefirot, which are ultimately a step-down, diminished version of Ein Sof that has limited itself in order that um, creation can occur and then, you know, we are able to perceive and appreciate it. But the nosemic view 
does away with that and says there's no emanationism. It's all Ein Sof, and these spherode are just display functions. There's not any diminishment nor step down version. It's all the divine, all the time, and it's only our lack of willingness to engage with the perception of it in such a, a way with purity that uh, oh, we can't appreciate it. So David's Kabbalah is unique, but grounded in ancient sources. Well, what is, uh, we only have a few minutes left here at the top of the hour, uh, so I, I'll get this question out as can, quickly as I can. What is presented in David's books doesn't seem at all like the Kabbalah and alchemy that most people are accustomed to. How does his work fit into those traditions? You did touch on that uh, in your last question on how it fits in the traditions, but could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah, I'd like to, to touch on his artwork specifically because I think that really ties it in. Um, he, his sources uh, for his artwork include things like um, traditional Kabbalistic shviti, like uh, study diagrams or ilanot, which are uh, extensive, elaborate Kabbalistic diagrams from uh, the Middle Ages. And his drawings evoke uh, the alchemical drawings of the 16th and 17th century in many respects with its attention to detail and the, uh, the way he plays with luminosity. But uh, he also has sort of foundational aspects for this artwork, which are geometry, linguistics, and biomorphism. So those are also combined. So you get a very, what I would say is a very kind of psychedelic effect to the artwork, even though it's black and white and he's playing with uh, luminosity in the work itself. Uh, it really draws forth a, uh, a timeless flavor that I think these alchemical drawings from these old books also evoke in, in certainly in me. Well, they do to me, too, and, and uh, I haven't seen these, obviously, in the past, but when I look at them, the, well, I can't help but say that the mandalic forms of them uh, bring them more into focus as, as centering, centering ourselves in this particular work. Boy, this is really interesting to me, and I hope to some of our listeners out there uh, to take this uh, uh, information seriously. Um, I do want to mention this before we go on break. I want to make sure that uh, the books that we're talking about include Deep Principles of Kabbalistic Alchemy. It's published by Lightning Flash of Aleph and The Awakening Ground, A Guide to Contemplative Mysticism. And that's published by Baron Company at uh, David's website, davidkayamsmith.com. And of course, uh, you find all of this information is linked on the front page of 21st Century Radio. And also, what we have referred to before uh, with Greg's show. Check out Greg's show online where they talk about ancient civilizations, world religion, symbolism, and more. www.occultofpersonality.net we got about a minute here. What would you like to say to conclude this hour? Well, I, I really hope people are able to appreciate the unique and radical mystical nature of David's work because it is as radically mystical as it gets. And I can say that from years and years of experience. This is – I've looked for the bottom of the, of the rabbit hole, and as far as I can tell, this is it. Fortunate. That is very fortunate for you, and it's fortunate for us as well. We're going to take our break top at the top of the hour here, friends. Again, all of these sites are linked on the front page of 21stCenturyRadio.com. We'll be back in just a few minutes.
Morning Talk and Breaking News on Talk Radio 680 WCBM, Baltimore, and WCBM.com. Looking at...